Hello and thank you for joining me. Today we are once more taking a trip into the sausage making world with detailed instructions and explanations. I recently got a new job and in the restaurant world that means I now have access to a different selection of scraps and leftovers. In this case, it's lamb trim. Nice lamb trim coming from Kildare, Ireland. And I've got a lot of it. I was told my new co-workers were getting sick of eating braised lamb for staff meal, so I knew I wanted to do something transformative with it so it didn't feel and taste like the same old lamb. And what better transformation than a sausage transformation? So let's get into it. And before we get started, I just want to say a quick word about sanitation. Making any kind of sausage should be a clean process from start to finish. You don't have to be paranoid, just make sure you clean all work surfaces and equipment well before starting. I will be using a large section of my counter for the forming of the sausages, so I make sure it is well cleaned ahead of time. And really quickly, let's also talk numbers because I like to be precise when seasoning my sausage. And full disclosure, I'm working mostly in weight, which I highly recommend. It just makes everything much more accurate and it makes it super easy to adjust a recipe if necessary. Often when I make sausages, I will just buy a whole cut of meat instead of buying a specific amount of meat to match a recipe. Or in this case, I'm starting with more meat than the original recipe calls for. In both cases, I need to adjust, which is very easy. I had a lot of meat, so I just decided to take two kilos of it for this particular sausage but the original recipe calls for 1.8 kilos, so I need to adjust slightly. The formula is new divided by old. In this case, my new number is the two kilos of meat that I have divided by the 1.8 kilos from the original recipe. That gives us 1.1 repeating, which is our conversion factor. I then take that number and multiply it by each of the ingredients for the original recipe to convert. This also shows why it's much easier to work with recipes by weight once you go to convert. I later converted that wine to grams because I think weighing out 275 grams of wine on the scale is much easier than eyeballing 1.1 cups of wine. And look, I know this probably seems stuffy and uptight, especially given the small difference in the recipe. But I'm not completely unreasonable. The garlic, black pepper, and rosemary, I knew I would just be eyeballing a slightly larger amount of. But when it comes to the amount of salt, fat, and milk powder, I don't mess around. Salt is not just important for the seasoning of the sausage, but also for the texture, as is the fat and the milk powder. In fact, when I look at recipes for sausage online, I just ignore the salt that is listed and instead come up with my own measurement by calculating 2% from the total weight of the meat that I have. Same process for the milk powder. Fat is a little trickier because it depends on what kind of meat you are using and even which cut of that meat you are using. In general though, 70% lean meat to 30% fat is a pretty safe place to be. Luckily the recipe I was using already accounted for this. Because lamb shoulder is much leaner than pork shoulder for example, additional pure fat needs to be added to prevent the sausage from being dry and grainy. The recipe I used had a fat amount of 25% which I knew would be okay. So all I did was multiply the original weight of the fat by our conversion factor. Yes, I know it's been a lot of talking so far, but let's finally get into it. There is red wine in this recipe, but I thought it might be more flavorful if I reduced that wine. So I will actually be using double the amount of wine and then reducing it by half. I'm just using this inexpensive Zinfandel I had around the house, but any full bodied red wine will do nicely. I get that on the stove, bring it up to a boil, and then I let it reduce while we work on our lamb scraps. This lamb meat was already cut up to some extent when I got it, but not quite enough to fit into my meat grinder. So I just need to go through and use my knife to cut things up a bit smaller. The same is true for the fat. The butcher I went to was actually out of lamb fat, so this is actually beef fat. This will make the lamb taste a little bit more mild overall, but it will still be delicious. Back to our reduced wine, we are looking pretty good but I just want to weigh that out to make sure we are hitting our target weight. 
And once I'm pretty close, I just set it back on the stove over low heat because I will need it again in just a moment. We are using a decent amount of garlic in this. I just break up that head, peel the cloves that I need, and then I do a pretty rough chop on those. And I love garlic, but I want the flavor of the sausage to be kind of mellow overall. And so to make sure that the garlic doesn't overpower things, I tossed it into my wine when it was almost done reducing. The acid and heat from the wine should round out the rougher edges of our potent garlic. I let the garlic steep in the wine for a couple of minutes and then transfer both to a container and let that cool in the fridge until I need it. And now for the last few ingredients, I'll start with the milk powder and the salt. And as mentioned, we want 2% of each of those, which for two kilos of meat is 40 grams each respectively. Rosemary is one of the primary players here, but I find that fresh rosemary can be a little astringent. On top of that, I've had this dried rosemary in my cabinet that never gets used very much, so I'm going the dry route. And as promised, no scale. Original recipe calls for a quarter cup of fresh rosemary, but when using dry herbs in place of fresh, use half the measurement as they are much more compact. In this case, that's two tablespoons plus a little extra or two heaping pinches from my big fingers. I've also got some black peppercorn, which I will just grind until I have what looks like a generous tablespoon. And it wasn't called for in the recipe, but I also wanted to add a little bit of dried red chili. A little spice is always nice. So now our seasoning is ready and our meat and fat is ready to grind. So let's get grinding. I set up my stand mixer and get the meat grinder attachment, well, attached. And today I'm using the coarse grind plate. Then I just make sure I have a decent camera angle, power on the machine, and get to feeding the meat into the appliance. And slowly but surely, we work our way through all of the meat and then I finish with the fat. And there we have it, all of our meat and fat ground up in a nice big bowl. And now for incorporating the seasoning, this is another important step to achieving a good texture. Thorough mixing is important, so I'll be using the paddle attachment for the stand mixer, but to give it a little head start, I go ahead and add my dry spices, salt, and milk powder and give it a rough mix with my clean hand. And because the bowl of my stand mixer can only handle so much, I'm splitting the workload up into two batches. I get that in the mixer and let it run. And once it has run for about half a minute or so, I start to drizzle in half of that wine and garlic mix, which is cold at this point. Anytime you incorporate a liquid element into your sausage mix, you want it to be cold. It helps the fat meld with the lean meat. And then I let the machine run for a few minutes until the meat looks thoroughly mixed. Pay attention to the fat. It will kind of form a film on the bottom of the bowl. Kind of reminds me of when you make pate choux dough. After the first round is done, I get the meat mix out of the stand mixer. Here you can see the processed and the unprocessed meat next to each other and how different they look. You can really tell there has been a transformation from the color and the texture. That's what we want. And so now I get the last half of our meat in the mixer and let it rip, using up the last of that red wine and garlic reduction. And a little Jacques Pepin move here, we give ourselves just a little splash of that raw red wine, so we have a bit of the fresh taste as well. After the second round, I had both batches in the big bowl and gave it a final mix with my hand to ensure even distribution of our liquid components. At this point, it's also not a bad idea to take out a small amount and fry it up for a quick taste test. And I was satisfied, so no need for adjustments. And we are technically done now. This is, in fact, lamb sausage. But the question is how you might want to proceed from this point. You could certainly just fry this up as a crumbled sausage for a pasta dish, or you could incorporate it into a bolognese, or you could form it into little lamb meatballs. But I bought this sausage stuffer, so I feel inclined to use it. I just get that set up on my counter, and let's talk casing. Today, I'm keeping things in the family and using lamb casing, 
but you could certainly use hog casing instead. Either way, you will want to make sure you soak your casings in lukewarm water for about 10 minutes, changing out the water a couple of times to make sure that they are well rinsed. Then it's time to feed the casing onto the tube of the stuffer. I recommend having a bowl of water on your work surface because it makes life easier. Wetting the tube makes the process easier and prevents tears. You will maybe run into knots, but that is just part of life. Untangle what you can and cut your losses after that. Once you have your tube loaded with casing, load your sausage stuffer with your sausage mix. You want to avoid air pockets, so I usually form the sausage into balls and then drop it into the stuffer and then give it a little pack down before adding the next ball. Repeat until the stuffer is fully loaded. And then it's time for the most artful part of the process, actually stuffing the sausages. I crank the handle until I see the sausage at the end of the tube, and then I tie a knot in the casing. Now it's all about finding the right balance of speed of sausage output and slack of the casing, a balance I have certainly not mastered yet especially with my wobbly setup. One day I need to build myself some kind of rig, but for now, I can make do with what I have. And don't stress too much if the casings aren't filled perfectly evenly. If anything, I recommend airing on the side of slightly less filled than slightly overfilled because the meat will swell when it cooks. So slightly loose sausages will plump up a bit while overstuffed ones will probably burst. And then after some patience, I eventually had two nice coils of lamb sausage, and I will leave them as is. You certainly could go through and twist them into links, but this was just a project for making a fun staff meal, so I'm happy with this. I cooked them off on the flat top at work, and it made me feel like I was at some sort of New York City Italian street fair. And I gave you a few options if you don't have a stuffer or casings, but here is one more idea if you still really want something tube shaped. Give yourself some nice big sheets of plastic wrap on your counter, overlapping so you don't have any gaps. Now take some of your sausage mix and use your hands to form it into an approximate even log shape. Now pull the plastic wrap up over the length of your sausage and then roll it up in the plastic wrap. And once it is completely wrapped, pinch the plastic at the ends of the sausage and then roll the log forward a number of times. The wrap will catch on the counter and tighten up as you roll, giving you a mostly watertight sausage link substitute. And one final note on cooking the sausages, I'm a big fan of poaching sausages before using them, especially if I plan to fry them in a pan or cook them on the grill. It's very helpful in preventing bursting and it's also useful from the food safety perspective. You don't have to worry about your sausages being charred on the outside but raw on the inside. You just get the perfect color you want, and there is no doubt that you are fully cooked inside. But there we have it, rosemary and red wine sausages trim that would have otherwise been wasted turned into something special. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed a detailed look into the intimate world of sausage making. I'm no stuffing expert, but I certainly love sharing my journey through the process. Making your own homemade sausage takes a bit of effort and has its moments of uncertainty, but I promise that even if you end up with funny looking sausages, the taste will make all your efforts feel worthwhile. It's just so much nicer than the big brand name stuff at the grocery store, and you can customize it to make it your own. Please help me out by hitting that like button and subscribing. These projects always end up taking more time than I realize. Cooking, filming the cooking, editing, script writing, but I'm happy with it as long as I know that there are people out there that find these projects informative or at the very least enjoyable. And please drop a line in the comment section if you have any questions, concerns, or thoughts that come to you while watching. Algorithms aside, it's just nice to engage with viewers and get feedback. And until next time, cheers! <laughs>